Hello everyone, welcome to this week's Bounty episode of the Day Zero Podcast. This one's a bit of a special one because we have a guest with us today. Uh, so I'm Spectre, with me is Z, and our guest today is Bastian Gruber, um, author of an upcoming book around the use of Rust in web development. As such, the first half of the episode today we'll be talking with Bastian, um, discussing his book and Rust in general. Then we'll get into our usual weekly topics later on. So Bastian, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself here. Yeah, hey. Um... I'm I'm Bastian. I'm from Germany. I'm a software developer for the past 10, 15 like years. And for the past um, two or three years, I'm like working more closely with the Rust programming language. And I'm currently writing the book called Rust Web Development, where I give a, like a pragmatic introduction to the language and how to use it in a web environment. And yeah, I'm all things around Rust for the past few years. I'm like mostly uh, like a software developer, a freelancer, and yeah, like Rust M solved an important problem for me in the past. So I'm happy to be on the show and talk about Rust. So I. All right, cool. Um, uh, I was just going to ask uh, for the book there. I know right now it's still pre publication. I mean, we can get kind of like the early access, but do you have a plan for it? Is it still planning to go up in February or? Yeah, so I actually, I just am finished um, this afternoon, the chapter six. So this should go into like the review phase now. And I'm planning to write now like one chapter every three to four weeks. So I'm on schedule to be done by February, like March. And then it depends on the internal review process and it also depends a bit on the reader so if you buy the book now you can leave the comments online in a forum and and yeah like you can give give your feedback to the book and i try to implement it so it also depends a bit on the feedback how far off i am on the topics but it should be good by february march yeah yeah so i guess early early-ish next year oh um, yeah right all right yeah I, I had seen that day floating around but wasn't sure if that was going to be accurate and who are you kind of targeting with this book um, um like would you so, be targeting experienced devs or like switching over to rust or would it be good for beginners um so you should have a few like experiences with rust but nothing more than maybe have worked halfway through the Rust book or have done a few like weekend coding sessions like with Rust. And from there, I pick you up. So um, you can say that you're like sort of new to the language, but you should have a prior programming background because I don't go into details about every topic. Um, but I think the common Rust engineer is probably a bit bored, maybe by Java or by Node.js and wants to switch. And before you pick up the book, maybe like use a few hours each weekend for a month to get into the language a bit. And then you can start to read my book. So it's meant as an easy entrance into the web environment like with Rust. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not an yes. expert. Yeah. Yeah. Lo looking at the table of contents here, I see. Yeah, you kind of jump into more on the Y Rust foundation, then right into doing the web dev. So it's not really an intro to Rust, just intro to web development in Rust. Interesting. Right, and it's also meant because I came across, and if you work in larger companies, maybe a small group of developers like want to write the next like um yeah, like the next microservice in go or they want to write it in like node.js and then the team lead asks, well why why do you want like this is just more work it's not needed it's fine like let's keep writing java and this um, section is meant to show like a cto or to a team lead why the rust language is more than just the syntax and why it actually could make sense to move to this language you know this is going to be a quick change but i guess i should mention also um we do have a coupon for anybody who's interested either in buying this or anything else from manning um 35 off using pod day zero 21 uh 
21 is the number, pod day zero, all lowercase, as a coupon code. Uh, forgot to mention that a little bit earlier. And we will also be giving away a copy of this book. Uh, more details about that a little bit later. Uh, so, you know what? I'll, I'll bring up a question out of chat, though, to you. Um, yeah. We have Balika, one of our regulars, uh, saying, I hate Russ, change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh why choose for us or especially why so web development i i can kind of see why you might choose it on web dev but i definitely think of Rust as more on the systems programming and not web so it does feel a little bit weird to me almost yeah. reminds me of the um it's kind of a joke book about uh web development and assembly yeah. um, obviously <laughs> rust has a lot more features on that but yeah i mean um, a... i th so um, I can speak from the website. I think that the compiler and the type system are might be like reasons enough to switch after you've worked with this strong compiler and expressive type system for more than a few weeks, or you finished a microservice in Rust. I I like yet have to see a person who didn't fall in love a little bit with the language. And I chose to go down the Rust path just because the combination, it's just like I'm so much better to write a robust web application with Rust than it is with Node.js. It's, it, it's far more like expressive than Go and it's more performant than Java. Um, I think it makes sense. It's in the blockchain world. It's more and more um, like whatever yeah, like you might think about this technology, um, but it's chosen more and more like in game development um, and yeah, like maybe like at some point in the kernel. So I think it will be part of the ecosystem and yeah. Yeah, like it's Rust, just, yeah. I, I doubt it's going anywhere. <laughs> like I said, yeah. uh, actually there has been some movement on the kernel. I think it's hit Linux next. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, did it? I didn't even... I, I wasn't following that too closely. Has it already landed? I believe so. Maybe I'd have to go double-check that. I know they've been working on getting it in the build system, and I recall that coming up actually at last year's Linux Security uh, Summit, or was it the Plumbers Conference? Right. One of the Linux conferences last year. They were discussing specifically I've... that. Yeah, right. I think I've read an article on LLWN and I'm on the mailing list um, just to follow up on the topic. Um, I think like what someone like mentioned that it might be five, six years down the line, but it seems like likely that the road will go, that you have like rust in the kernel, but it might take some time. Uh, yeah, Balik I... is saying it might have also been ported to uh, platform security processors, which is very interesting. I didn't know that that was a like an avenue that people were trying to get rust into though it totally makes sense i mean when you're talking about trusted execution but uh yeah i just thought i'd bring that out of chat real quick since mm. we're talking about that area well, yeah. i definitely read that as playstation portable <laughs> 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 um yeah, yeah um, i mean i did oh, want to jump ahead. back a little bit on the idea of like comparing go and rust because uh, you kind of brought it up tentatively with talking about go being used in web dev and yeah. when when i think about web development and servers and networking my mind does go to golang and you know to be honest like i am kind of a a gopher i guess i do really like the language mm. um i guess the i think the thing people hate the most about go is the garbage collection which mm -hmm. rust is kind of a, a solution for i guess right um i mean the thing that comes to mind there is discord I remember when Discord did a blog post because their back end for a while was in Golang. And I think they switched over to Rust actually specifically because um, they found the garbage collector was causing them some problems uh, with performance and, and server downtime or I forget what the exact specifics were. But yeah, I mean, it's just interesting with trying to compare Go with Rust in the web um, because as far as I know, Rust still doesn't have any HTTP support built in, right? Whereas Golang, that's kind of something you get for free. This is the major point, I think, where people complain a bit that also there is no asynchronous runtime built into the standard library and HTTP is also not there. And I doubt that it will become part of the standard library. Maybe it will. 
Um, but this is a drawback, which then for many people, they ask themselves, well, then why would I choose like Rust if Go ships with everything I need? Um, and that's a downside. This is just something you have to accept. It's not perfect. But the compiler and the type system are so strong that I think it's fine. Like once you choose your tools and the libraries are well maintained, you won't like notice that it's not in the standard library. Um, it's in the beginning a bit rough and in the first few weeks, but then I think it's it doesn't really matter. So yeah, you think that's... it's like worth it in the long run, basically? Yeah, and it's not to say, so um, I've worked in companies where then there was a Go team and there was a Rust team and the high performance part was then in and then in like Rust and um, some of the microservices were built in Go or like with Go. Um, so I think they can coexist, obviously, um, but this could be an argument that the part of your stack or your, your um, server applications which have to be high performant can be in Rust and the general landscape of your applications can be still in Go. Um, but like what the huge advantages in Rust in a web context is the library called um, Serde, which makes it um, so beautifully easy to convert or to serialize and deserialize from into JSON or, or to Bison or to other formats. Um, after you got the hang of this whole ecosystem, it becomes really, really a joy to use through all the helpers. And then it could be an advantage of, of not having it built in the standard library because then, I don't know, like a group of people can come in and build a better runtime or they can build a better HTTP abstraction or a server in the future. Yeah, I would kind of agree with you there. I don't see a huge issue with it not being in the standard library. Like there are benefits to it, but I don't see a problem with also having competing options for it. I mean, it does split development in a sense, but I don't, I've never really thought of that one as a downside to me. Like you mentioned that there's that first few weeks, you now fighting with the borrow checker as you're learning Rust mm -hmm. and stuff. It's it's one of the things I've kind of said for learning Rust purely to go through that pain because it does teach yeah. you good habits that apply to other languages too, even if you're not using Rust. Um, just learning it, I think, is a useful thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too, yeah. Yeah, actually around the borrow checker and, and fighting with the compiler, I did check out a uh, a talk that you gave Bastion at uh, Rust Until Berlin a few months ago, um, mm -hmm. and I really enjoyed that talk. But one thing that I remember from it um, that just came to mind when Z was talking about, uh, you know, fighting the borrow checker is in that talk. I believe you said that you kind of like the idea of fighting with the compiler, and you don't think of it as fighting. You think of it as more of like a dance. Um, mm -hmm. I, I figured maybe like would you be able to elaborate on that a little bit because I feel like most people's biggest concern with rust is like how hard it is to get yeah. something going in it because of that you know fight with the compiler so to speak yeah. so and yeah and i have a, I'm two different angles like the first one it might apply to your or to um, to your like i'm a financial or like your a business mindset because i think that we start in this next few um, with generations where like the easy money in the web development is probably covered like at some point by no code solutions where you can prototype and build simple applications um, by AI or by different products. So I think your um, salary is decreasing by the year <laughs> if you have like a Node, a Node MHS or like a PHP or a Java background. This might sound harsh, but I think that you're always on the hunt to learn a new skill to maintain your um, salary in the future. And um, therefore, from this angle, I think to fight the borrow checker, and I call this like the good pain, and there's bad pain and good pain. And I think that you learn a lot through good pain. So, And I think the fighting the borrow checker is good pain. Um, as I think MC said, that you learn something and you are like enhancing your mindset and you learn something about memory, 
um yeah so like i'm a f and even if you then don't choose rust as a programming language you're already i feel like a better software developer by going through the learning experience and i struggled with node.js but this was like because of the language and because it was not so easy to build complex applications with and i call this pain just bad pain because it doesn't help you like once you solved it you didn't really gain much skills um, and in rust i feel like every bit you learn is enhancing your understanding about types about memory allocations maybe about pointers which is needed in high performance environments so i don't think it's a wasted time. And I can see that so many people maybe come to the language and they want just to switch their syntax and want this gain in speed. So they maybe come from like Node or Go and they just want to write Rust now as they have written Go or Node in the past. And I think this is a missed opportunity. Um, I think that you have to make a step up maybe for some people. And I had to do like a big step up to learn the language but it made me a better developer and i think therefore it's good to learn this language from different uh, yeah yeah i mean and I just on a security clear. front um i'd kind of argue you know playing around with rust and again fighting the borrow checker it does end up teaching you a lot about proper or good practices when it comes to the concurrency issues well with ownership in general um yeah. And that does apply, you know, even onto other languages, you know, okay, you're looking at some uh, C++ code or something, you might notice that it's doing something a little bit weirdly, a little bit non-standard. Now, of course, C++, you can do that. It's not going to stop you from it like Rust will, but it makes you aware of certain patterns that maybe mm. you weren't before. Maybe you've done all the research into, you know, parallel programming and distributed stuff. And you know all that already, then maybe you're not getting as much out of it. Right. But it does give you kind of a practical way of learning on that. Um, maintainability is, or is kind of, I think, another fair point. Um, you, you brought up Node. I feel like my issue, I've done a little bit of web dev in Node. Nothing too huge, but, you know, it's it's such a dynamic language that it's so easy to either make mistakes or just forget, you know, typing. I mean, now, you know, you've got TypeScript and you've got type hinting and stuff, uh, or type hinting in Python. Um, but with Rust, I mean, it you're less productive in it, but it's yeah. still... You get a lot of benefits despite losing some of that productivity in terms of maintainability. Or at least it's kind right. of how I felt about it. Yeah, so it's much harder to prototype in Rust since, and I have like many friends who complained and then they slacked me and said, hey, like I just want to fetch a simple um, data from an HTTP API. Um, but it was so hard and I had to structure and think and it took me ages to get this done. Like how, like how, how can this be a good language to develop large applications with? And I think this is a sign of a language which is good for larger applications because you have to set up types in some way. You can't um, cheat yourself out of it. And I think it's it's good, like it keeps you in check. And as you said, then the larger complex applications are probably then easier to maintain. And I worked as a freelancer. I went to different like I'm a tech shops and I had Node.js applications. And before each project, I knew that the code base I will find will look completely different than the last one. Because it's such a small and dynamic language, you can write JavaScript as you wish and get in all sorts of trouble, which is not possible with Rust. With Rust, is there, um, I guess, a uh, idiomatic way of writing Rust? Like, is there kind of a, with Python, you often talk about like it being Pythonic. Is there something equal mm. when it comes to Rust? 
I think it's um, slowly there um, because it doesn't have a wide attraction yet, at least not in the public. There are less books out about this stuff. There's less experience out. I would say an experienced Rust developer might have two years or three years of experience now, um, which is not long enough to develop maybe such patterns. But there are a few um, idiom, idiom, how you say idiomatic ways. Idiomatic. Yeah, um, and um, yeah, and and um, there are some design patterns of how to write Rust or how to handle certain situations, but not in a sense of with Python or yeah. And I would say like not yet. And I worked in a in a company and we had developers coming from Java, from C plus plus, from Python. And you could see it a bit in the code um, that people maybe wanted to write Rust right, um, just like they wrote Java. And it sort of works, but you can see that this is not in a Rust way. Um, so I think it's hard to say. It probably takes a few more years until there is more of a broader pattern library of like what to do if X happens. You know, speaking of the Java, that kind of reminds me, you know, Rust, it, its whole type system is, in a sense, more more complex, but I guess maybe more expressive in terms of having, like, the types, having the traits, and all of that. Like, it's... Yeah. Um, and... Yeah. Sorry. Oh, I, I was just going to say that, you know, kind of adds on to trying to do things in the old way because you're roughly familiar, especially coming from Java, you know, you're roughly familiar with object oriented programming concepts and doesn't quite apply the same way when it comes to like inheritance, um, when it comes on to rust. Um, yeah, right. Uh yeah. I think one of the things that has kind of held me back from using rust a lot has been, the productivity like compile times are also a little bit of pain like i mean mm -hmm. i do a lot of and you know in security i feel like a lot of people write very quick things it's like i just want to quickly write something um like i i'd say like the dominant language for like offensive security so not so much security tooling on the defensive side is probably going to be python mm -hmm. might be able to call ruby you know if you're in metasploit land which is based on ruby uh, but otherwise, like Python's really popular. You know, we've got libraries for it, uh, like Pwn tools, uh, which just make like crafting a Rob chain, craft or just even assembling whatever very easy and has a lot of stuff wrapping around interacting with process or network, whatever. Just has a lot of things that kind of make it easy to be very quick. Mm -hmm. And Rust doesn't feel like it gives it that same kind of rapid development. So I right. guess I'd maybe ask you, like, what would be your pitch of Rust to kind of this other security people in here? Mm. I mean, I think that you hit a good point. Um, the compile times are slow. I think it will become better, like, with time. I think there's, like, a working group or, like, a focus group thinking about this. Um, so um, I don't have many arguments for Rust just yet, since I think the ecosystem is still a bit too small and um, too slow, as you said, with the rapid uh, prototyping. So um, I wouldn't maybe say just to ditch Python now and go on to Rust if you're in this field, um, because it's just plain not there yet. But I think it can be part of your tool chain. Um, it could be part of of your um, skills or like um, the exploits or like the scripts you write. It's still possible in Rust. Um, yeah. So, so I, I guess... Sorry, go ahead. No. Uh, so I was just going to say, like, I guess this kind of hits on that point of like, use the right tool for the job, right? Um, mm -hmm. If you're writing something quick and dirty and you need to be able to connect to a socket and send a payload over it, uh, you know, Python is probably fine for that or whatever you're comfortable using. Um, that said, so Rust, when it comes to security tooling, is a bit interesting. Um, 
There is a little bit of adoption that I've seen there, and uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of his work, but um, Gamozo, Gamozo Labs, uh, he does a lot of fuzzing stuff, and he is a big fan of Rust, so pretty much like every time he writes a new fuzzer, he's he's using Rust to do it. Okay. I think he's even written exploits in Rust, so... <laughs> um, th there is some like adoption and interest in the security community for it. I think something like a fuzzer is actually an interesting case to bring up when talking about a potential usage for us uh, because as an anecdote i was working on a fuzzing code base recently and one of the somewhat consistent problems i was having was the fuzzer would end up crashing a lot if you botched a definition or something um th mm -hmm. this was a grammar based fuzzer just to add some context there so mm -hmm. you know if you made a mistake when developing the fuzzer um it, it wouldn't be immediately obvious because the fuzzer is going to have mechanisms to immediately restart and everything. It's just not going to do anything useful. Um, it's either going to severely hinder the performance or it's going to completely break it. Um, and it, it wasn't because it was finding something interesting that it was crashing. It was just due to developer error. And I think this is this might highlight where something like the memory safety guarantees and stuff that Rust provides could save you a lot of trouble uh, in the long run, even though you have that trade off where um, you know, those safety guarantees at runtime do come at the cost of fighting the compiler and with the compile time overhead of the all the compile time checks. Um, and like every time you want to use Rust, I guess, for a tool, um, the ultimate question is like, is it worth it? Is that trade off worth it? Mm. And I think some tools in security like fuzzing, I think you could probably say yes. Um, so I did kind of want to bring that up as an example because. There's a lot of security things where I would agree, just use Python. It's not really, um, you don't really need all the benefits that Rust provides. But in something like a fuzzer or any of those critical components that are part of your uh, your defensive setup or whatever, I think Rust is probably worth consideration there at least. So uh, Yeah, and I, when I kind of mentioned the quick and dirty scripting, like I was definitely thinking about the exploit dev, but... Yeah, when it comes to longer tooling, I actually kind of agree with you. Like, if you need to maintain it, a lot of the Rust benefits really kind of start to send out when you need to work on the same code base for a while. Um, obviously, we've talked about other reasons to learn Rust that'll help out, but um, at least that's kind of my feeling on it. <laughs> like, that maintainability yeah. aspect. Yeah. Um. On the topic of trade-offs, uh, Z, I remember you mentioning something previously about um, zero-cost abstractions and wanting to talk about that a bit, but I forget exactly what it was. Um, if you remember what you wanted to ask about that, would you be able to bring it up? Well, I was just going to bring off, like, you know, Rust. Um, Rust is big, at least, on advertising. Well, or however you want to use that word. Oh. Um, the idea of zero cost abstractions where there are things in the language that don't add a lot of overhead or in theory add no overhead over writing it securely. Um, like its choice is over, like just in its language syntax. Um, I don't think it really has come up yet for this discussion or is too relevant though. Okay, fair enough. It's just something that I remembered and I couldn't remember exactly what the context was around that. Fair enough. I think... Um, that's also the reason why there is not a bigger standard library um, because like or like one of the design goals of Rust is that you shouldn't pay for something you don't use. And if you use the abstraction, you couldn't have hand coded it better than uh, like what the outcome of like a Rust abstraction is. Um, and of course, it's always hard to maintain and I'm not part of like the language team or have the skills to be part of the language team. Um, but I think this makes Rust also good in in this environment because it keeps a small binary and it's performant. So I'm thinking about them um, if you want to uh, parallelize like a work or an attack or um, something like this. Um, that the size of the binary and the speed of the language or of the produced program might be like a huge advantage. Um, so I think in this context, the design goals could help you in this environment. 
Yeah, and there are definitely a number of places in security where performance does kind of matter, uh, be that, you know, race conditions in the web, um, trying to exploit them, or as Spectre's already mentioned, the fuzzing aspect. I mean, you generally want the fuzzer to stay out of the way and have all your CPU mm. going to the actual fuzzing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's that's another case where, you know, if you have to pick between Golang and Russ, um, the lack of garbage collection and stuff that Russ provides is also another useful benefit there. Um, so I, I do think, like, we might see some more adoption going forward in the security industry for Rust. Um, it, it doesn't seem to be too huge at the moment beyond, like, talking about switching target applications to like applications under test to rust like what we were talking about earlier with linux kernel adopting some rust um but yeah in the tooling i think we might see more of it in the future um the final thing i wanted to bring up though around rust is z stated on the show in the past that he believes rust might be one of those languages where it brings a lot of good ideas to the table but the implementation is perhaps not great and those ideas might be consumed by another language, like a better language to take its place. I was just curious if you had any thoughts on that, where you have a lot more experience in the Rust world than either of us do. Um, like, do you see any potential problems with Rust in terms of widespread adoption going forward? Or would you say it's kind of already proven itself? Um, I think that we mentioned that the compile times and the hard and the harder to learn so I think um, because of of how the language looks and how you handle maybe lifetimes and these type of like advanced things are still kind of hard to grasp and to use in larger um, yeah in larger applications. If you have a large code base and you suddenly need to refactor something and you add a lifetime here you will get i don't know like maybe 20 30 compiler messages afterwards which um, tells you and now you have to add here this lifetime and this has to change um i think this is i'm um, hindering a little bit um smaller teams to move forward with rust or i can see that there might be a problem um Although I think in adoption, it's really the best language which gets adopted or the best technology. It's always maybe the third best and the best one has a smaller like market share. I think it has to be good enough. And at this point, a different language has to be maybe twice as good already as Rust. And I think it's quite hard. Um, there might be, and I'm not so religious about the language. If in five years there's like a better language, I'm happy. Um, but I see it as really, really hard to do or to find the foundation, to find the people, to find the sponsoring. I think it was sort of like a perfect um, breeding ground in the Mozilla Foundation and then to spread it out into the world. It's getting talked about like the Linux kernel which I think is a huge achievement and I don't th so I can't see like another language doing the same as Rust it might be better but it already has this brand now um, which is hard to get I play around like with lots of languages like Haskell or like I'm something else and they don't get picked up like widely so I yeah, think well, it's I Rust mean Haskell yeah. has its own fun issues when it comes to picking it up. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, and I, you make a good point. When it comes to sponsoring, that's been the one thing that's given me some pause when it comes to saying, like, I like what Rust is doing um, on many fronts. Like, the security, I already mentioned, like, the zero-cost abstractions, uh, kind of keeping itself out of the way. I love what it's doing there, but just approaching it as a developer i've got my areas of familiarity and just coming to rush just feels fairly uncomfortable and needing to fight with the borrow checker it gives a lot of the kind of rough edge feeling and that's where i felt like okay maybe another language will make these nicer like you said though i mean with the sponsoring 
Mozilla's been behind it for quite a while. Like, I think I first came across Rust in 2011 or so. Like, they've been on it for a good while. I maybe have to mm. double check. I just remember this is before it was 1.0. I was looking at, like, open source out of Mozilla in general. So, like, they've had a backing for a while. And that backing, like, most new languages don't have any sort of backing like right. that. So right. that adds, I think, a lot of weight. Like, Rust isn't going anywhere. I don't think Rust is going to disappear. Um, it's just... I do... I, I'd still like to see more, I guess, iterations on some of these mm. ideas that Rust has done. And maybe Rust itself will be the one that kind of spearheads those. Mm. But, cause, I mean, it is doing some good things when it comes, especially, you know, around the borrow checker and getting more security, actually confirmed by the compiler yeah no like this would be good if there is like another language would could take the good parts but it's already so hard to bring in in, in like a new language in your tool chain in the company in the environment you need so many people a huge community and the backing but it's going to take a while for that to happen with knows? any other language without a backing like Mozilla. I think the Canadian government is talking about like the basic income. So maybe this will give enough time for people to stay at home and to work on the language of the future. And then maybe those iterations, yeah, like might be faster. But I think this is a big, big, big thing. Speaking of the Canadian government, I think actually um, the Communication Security Establishment of Canada uh hires rust developers i might be mistaken i'm not going to go mm. pull up the job work now but i'm pretty sure i remember seeing rust listed on oh, their cool. like language requirement list or whatever on one of their job advertisements wouldn't surprise me too much um <clears throat> i did want to bring up something from chat that was relevant since you were talking about mozilla there um rudamal asked uh, i wonder how far did firefox get in rewriting everything in rust so for those not aware of what he was talking about there um mozilla started um something called the servo project which was the idea of rewriting um firefox or like a browser engine in rust um it did get a lot of attention it was a very interesting project unfortunately it was kind of killed off uh like a year ago or whatever it was when mozilla had to do a, a big downsize so yeah, unfortunately, that was one of the projects that didn't end up going to completion. Uh, it was a very interesting idea because, as we've said on the podcast before, browsers are probably the most complex code bases on Earth. So if there was something you were going to rewrite in Rust and wanted those memory safety guarantees, it would be a browser. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it, it kind of got killed off, but... Um, they did get pretty far on Servo. Um, I, I, I hadn't really used it or played around with it too much. Um, but I mean, they were developing that for like eight or nine years, I think. Um, cause uh, I think that was started They were developing in that as far as I know from the start. Um, like they were dog fooding it. Um, because Servo initially they weren't going to make that public. That was just something they were working on inside of Mozilla, as I understand it. Actually, Bastian, you might know more on the history than I do. Oh, um, actually. Mm -hmm. About the server project, actually, not so much. I thought it made it into like a nightly version of a Firefox at some point, or parts of it. Yeah, or with the, Quantum, they uh, yeah. they did bring in parts of Servo into uh, mainline Firefox. It, it some parts of it did make its way into the main engine, but I know originally, cause like I said, I was looking at. Uh, so back when I was working as a developer, I was looking at getting into open source development and thought, hey, you know, I use Firefox. Let's look at what Mozilla is doing and maybe I can get started, which is where I first came across Rust and found out about Servo back then um, and found out that, like they had it, but they didn't have it open source. Or, like you didn't have access to the code. And I believe that's changed now. Like they have released at least some of that. Plus the fact that it's made public, but it sounded more like they were using it as like, this is just our way of dog fooding the language, using it internally to, you know, figure mm. out what we need for the language. Um, and I mean, that process definitely paid off because they're, for all I've said about not liking how Rust is now, it was a bit more complex and annoying back in like the pre 1.0 days too. <laughs> Yeah, I remember a big point back then when um, 
we were discussing it a little bit in like a text chat. I don't even remember where exactly, but um, your point was on like the standard library support and stuff. You were like, it's 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 too immature to really use in a in a you know realistic application. But I, I guess you know that's changed a lot. Like you said, Rust has been around for a while. Um, just to clarify on the Servo point, um, Tanny Wan chat said Servo is now part of the Linux Foundation, so it's still around. So technically, kind of, sorta, but under the Linux Foundation, I don't like. I don't think there's been a lot of active development on it. It's it's one of those things where it's technically still alive by like by definition, but realistically, I don't think it's gonna. It, it's not really going anywhere. So it's, it's it went to the uh, the Linux graveyard, so to speak. Yeah. Since you brought up maturity, like, Rust, like, when they launched 1.0, that was a big deal, and I remember, because, I mean, that was, like, their commitment to not be breaking things and giving a stable language and stuff. Um, and, I mean, really, over the last few years, it feels like Rust has gotten a lot more adoption, um, and just in general, you know, has matured quite a bit. So I'm not sure how long ago... You might have had that discussion, but I know my feelings on Rust maturity have entirely changed since like 15 or 16. All right. Um, so that's pretty much everything that I had that I wanted to bring up around Rust and uh, using it in security tooling. Uh, Z, did you have anything else you wanted to bring up? Um, no, not really. All right, cool. So uh, I guess we'll We'll move uh, move ahead to wrapping up the discussion. Um, we don't want to take up too much of your time here, Bastion, and uh, I, I know the time is somewhat late for where you are. So, um, do you have any last thoughts you wanted to bring up, or any discussions you wanted to have uh, before you you jumped off? Um, I, I just um, le um just like a shout out, like not to my book, but um, I was am reading a book called um. Um, wait a second. Um, the book is called "I'm a Black Hat Rust," and I'm reading this for the past um few weeks now. And I think it's a good book for your community to go through and see like which tooling can be done in Rust. And I'm not like I don't know the person who wrote the book, or I'm not like like getting like a percentage out. And it's not my book, but I think it's like it's super interesting for your community to go through and see. Um, yeah, and he's writing um, shell codes and Rust and all of this stuff. Um, so I think it's just a good language to have in your tool chain. And it doesn't need to be your main language, but I think that you have an advantage if you know Rust and if you can facilitate it in your day-to-day -day life, I think you gain an advantage there by using it. So I was just, I just tried looking up the black half Rust here. Um... So a lot of the Black Hat series has been, I believe, from No Starge Press. And yeah, I'm looking it up and I'm not yeah. seeing it, but I did come across um, uh, this one from Kirkor Academy. Does that sound accurate? Yeah, I, yeah, I think like, yeah, Kirkor. So I'm not sure if it's like the level of quality you read and I'm not a professional. So I just like I read it through as a fun thing to learn like a few new things. But I'm not sure about like the background of the person or something. Yeah, fair enough. Because I was thinking, um, the Black Hat books generally are fairly well received. Like, so there's Black Hat Python that's been fairly popular for a while. Um, Black Hat Go, I actually did a review of, I think, on the podcast during one of our episodes. Um, yeah, I think that was I last year. Yeah, I wasn't aware of a uh, Black Hat rust but that does seem interesting i mean it is always nice you know to be able to learn a bit of the language in a context that you're actually interested in um versus just i mean just having something to help you and motivate you along to learning so yeah thanks for that shout out i wasn't even aware of it yeah same no. here but uh yeah like overall uh thank you for coming on we really appreciate it uh, especially given the time it is uh, over where you are um, like I said, toward the start of the show, Rust has come up a decent bit on the podcast history, but it's something that we only cover at like a surface level or in the context of a particular topic, since it's not really a language Z or I use often. So it was awesome to get your perspective on it as someone who likes and, and uses the language. Um, 
And, and like I said, I think Rust is perhaps overlooked quite a bit when it's when talking about using it in the area of security tooling. Um, before we get into the weekly topics, I wanted to remind you guys that Bastion has a book on the way. Um, that's estimated to come out sometime early 2022. Um, and they've generously offered us a copy to give away to one of you in their community. Uh, if you want to participate in that, head over to our Discord. Uh, we will have a giveaway channel set up there where you just have to react to the message in there and you'll be entered for a chance to win a copy. Um, that'll be running all week and we'll select winners next week on Monday. And uh, yeah, once again, just thanks for joining us, Bastion. I, I really enjoyed the discussions we had. Yeah, thank, thank you for, you for having us. me. I've enjoyed it. All right. So I guess we'll uh, we'll get into it. Uh, just before we jump into next thing, I will also say from uh, Taniwa, um, who asked, will it be signed? Unfortunately, no, it's for a digital edition of the book. So it, I, it won't I, be signed. I can send you my signature. <laughs> <laughs> or go. maybe that, yeah. Um, and I will right. also mention again that we do also have the coupon code just if you want to buy it or anything else off of Manning. Um, it's pod day 021, all lowercase except the numbers, which are numbers. Um, and yeah, uh, I just wanted to bring that up before we moved on. I, I do appreciate that chat comment of could be an NFT. <laughs> uh, I love NFT memes, but uh. Yeah, so we'll go ahead and get into some of our, our topics for uh, for the weekly topics. So up first, we have something that's uh, kind of fun. We have some signature forgery vulnerabilities in Stark Bank ECDSA libraries, um, which are used as part of the Stark Bank ecosystem, but are also able to be used by other projects as it's available um, on things like NPM. Um, basically, this is one root issue that affects multiple libraries and thus has five CVEs. Uh, it exists in Python, Java, .NET, Elixir, and Node ECDSA libraries. Um, the post goes into some background on ECDSA here. Um, that's elliptic curve digital signature algorithm for those unfamiliar. Um, basically, what you need to know from it to understand the issue is when validate, uh, validating a signature, there's various different variables that are used. Um, and, you know, obviously it's pretty mathy here because it's crypto and the entire idea of elliptic curve is is like using a graph and coordinates and stuff. Um, so I, I don't want to go too much into the calculations of that because they're not fully relevant for understanding the bug um, beyond just this like isolated um, area. And to be honest, a lot of it does go over my head. Yeah, but I mean, there's... it's as a, I mean, I'm just going to jump right to the point. As a bug, um, it all just has to do with um, what the multiplicative inverse of zero is. Um, if you don't know what that is, um, if you ever had to calculate the inverse of something in school where you do like one over the number, um, that's the inverse. It's a little bit different when it comes to the elliptic curves. Uh, so you're in a set, so it's, you know, uh, you're finding what number multiplied by numbers congruent to one mod, whatever. Doesn't matter. Basically, you set the signature to zero, R and S, the two values for the signature, the point, set that to zero. Um, and it'll work. It'll say that this is a valid signature for everything. Um, so I mean, yeah, th that's, that's the bug there. Um, sorry, Spectre, go ahead. Sound like you're going to say something. It. Yeah. Getting a little is like Z was saying there, if the R and S values are zero, um, those are used in multiplication operations when checking the signature. So the S value in particular is used to get the inverse, uh, which is um, Unfortunately, Spectre, you just cut out on me. I'm not hearing anything from oh. you. Um, Am I coming down? Or... You are now. Okay, cool. Um, so I'll just kind of reiterate that. Um, the S value in particular is used to get an inverse, which, as he mentioned, the inverse of zero is zero. In Something does not like you talking about this bug. <laughs> it's like really? we're being censored. Oh, man. Because okay. it, it was almost in the same place. Too. <laughs> uh, okay. um, Let's try it one more time. Third time's a charm. So the S value in particular um, is used to get an inverse, and the inverse of zero is zero in most um, invert function implementations. Well, so then, 
the problem is that the inverse of zero should not be zero. The inverse of so the actual bug is introduced because of the fact that this even has a value for the inverse of zero. Um, well, because that would be of. one divided by zero, or you know, so, you put in the mod, but so the problem is more that. So you, you cut out again. Um, two issues being with this thing is one being um, the fact that the in so the inverse of zero in this case is zero, um, which is just a mathematical problem. In this for this bug, it's also the fact that those values should not be zero um, to begin with. Like they should be checking the range, making sure it's greater than one and less than the order of the curve. Um, and as for the question of chaff from Taniwa, uh, inverse of zero is what? Undefined. Um, it is specifically undefined. A lot of people kind of think about it as being infinite. Giving it a value creates some really weird math problems. Uh, but yeah, so the issue in the code here, since this is a library, is the fact they don't actually ensure that the number is greater than zero, um, which it should be. Like, the value shouldn't be zero, and the fact... Um, so if the inverse would have returned like an error here, given some, some other weird value, this wouldn't have been an exploitable bug, but because they have a value for it, it's also a problem with, uh, the fact that, um, with the fact they do give the inverse a value. Um, and out of chat there, actually, Spectre out of chat. Oh, I thought it was Infinity also, to be honest. Yeah, a lot of people kind of intuitively think you know, zero goes into something infinite number of times. Um, mathematically speaking, there's strong evidence for setting it as undefined rather than actually assigning it a value. When you assign it a value, even as Infinity... I don't know all the math on it. I'm sorry. I can't go into that explanation. But there are some very weird things that happen to math as a whole as soon as you start giving it a value. Actually, if you've seen those cases of people proving um, something like uh, like 1 equals 0 is kind of the meme thing to do where people will do all this weird math, almost always they go and divide by 0 somewhere in there and just by having a value for that and it being allowed creates problems uh specter your audio we kind of just lost you permanently since i saw you in chat or can you talk again i uh, know i just want to cut you off um hopefully you know <laughs> that's coming through all right yes all right. you are um yeah because I, I did kind of want to challenge what you were saying a little bit um so you were saying like the bug here was the fact that you know it allows an inverse of zero to go through and, and become like assigning the value basically um and, you know, when that's used later on and multiplying it against the curve variables for calculating the coordinates, it ends up corrupting it. So when it checks if R is equal to the X value of the curve, um, the X value will be zero. So it just does not check if zero equals zero. And that makes the signature check succeed. Um, so you were kind of pinning it to the inverse function allowing a value through. Well, I pin it to two things. The fact that it doesn't check the range because... R and S should not be zero in any case. So it should be ensuring the range okay. is between one and the order. And I did mention that. Maybe you didn't hear it because of uh, your audio issues, but I did call that out also. Yeah, so I didn't hear that part um, because that was one thing I really wanted to hammer home is like the ECDSA specification explicitly outlines that R and S cannot be allowed to be zero. So like that's the main issue here is that they allow these arbitrary values and they don't do any range checking on them. Um, that said, I think it is fair to call out like the the way that the inverse function is working here too as like another bug maybe. Although it is such a weird edge case that it would be really hard to handle at a language level. I mean, what are you supposed to do as an alternative in this situation? Crash. crash? Always Throw crash. Just crash. Okay, but what about <laughs> no, languages no exceptions, where you can't only crash? crashing? <laughs> yeah, what about what about languages where that's not really a possibility though? No, um, I, and that was so a joke. Um, realistically, I don't know what a good answer is. Um, it does feel like throwing an exception makes sense. Um, and in terms of their code, I feel like their code, it, the issue is the range check. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of, well, I mean, it's still their own library, so it is still their code. But the math, I don't know, I maybe have to look, because it's one of those bugs, even if it exists, generally it's not going to create a security issue except in crypto. 
Uh, but it does feel like they should return something, some air, rather than giving it a value of zero. Like, giving it any other value kind of would have broken things. Um, obviously, yeah. most languages don't have, like, a nan or, uh, like, you could use null, but that comes out to being zero. Like, it, it feels like probably tossing an exception or an error value. Uh, or in Python, you know, raising an error. Yeah, so so Taniwa mentions, like, um, boundary check and exit, return an error, throw an exception. So, yes, in this specific case, like, that's what you would do, right? You would check if R and, or S are zero, and if so, you just bail out. Um, the reason I bring up that question is, like, what about some other cases where you could use, like, the inverse function? Um, like, it's just the inverse function in and of itself. How do you handle that in an isolated context of, like, well, how uh, do languages handle zero? division by zero? Yeah, I mean, it like, depends, I mean, it's right? kind like, of the same thing. Most yeah. languages will cost they some will air out crash. on you. I can't yes. actually tell you what it'll do because I don't often divide by zero. So, like, it, like, I mean, obviously they do something, but it's, it's not something I'm intimately familiar with to recall here. I will say I've, I've divided by zero. Um, it's actually somewhat easy to do when you start doing anything with modulo operations because it's easy to forget when you're using modulo to forget or yeah, like you just don't think like, oh yeah, there's a division happening here. So I've written C before where I've done a modulo and somehow or another that led to a divide by zero happening. And you know, you get a divide by zero exception from the CPU. It, it doesn't like it very much. Um, that said in the higher level languages, that's where it gets a little bit tricky, right? Um, like, I don't know exactly what happens if you try to do it in JavaScript. That's that's one area where I haven't really tried that. Um, but yeah, again, it's just kind of the, that case of tricky edge cases and like, what do you do um, in the inverse function if it doesn't like it? I mean, you can do all of those things. If the language supports exceptions, I think exceptions make the most sense. Um, other Like outside of exceptions, though, it gets trickier because you're saying like, maybe you could have an error return but the entire idea of like these math functions is it depends on the input. It could be arbitrary. What do you assign for an error code? Well, when like I was thinking of that, um, specifically was um, like uh, GoLang, where you have the separate error returns, usually, oh, like, like where tuples. you do multiple returns. That's kind of what I was thinking. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, if you, um, if you factor tuples into it, it, it makes a bit more sense, yeah. Yeah, if you think about C, though, like, how would C handle it? That becomes... Yeah. I, I don't I know, mean, maybe, it, maybe it isn't as interesting as I'm thinking if by, like, a professional C dev. Oh. I mean, crashing seems like your only option, really, in C. <laughs> Unless you return a structure or something that kind of functions like a tuple where it has a value and an error code in it. You could you could kind of hack well, you, it. You could it recreate like that, but... it, but that's not really a normal thing to do in C. No. But yeah, it's just something I wanted to quickly bring up because that fun that issue in particular is is tough. But yeah, I mean ultimately the main issue there is just allowing unchecked RNS through. But yeah, I mean I, I wanted to cover this topic. Like, unfortunately, we couldn't go too deep into the math because crypto is just, it's hard. Um, Good and show it's, it's from Kenny Wall again. Um, set the air number and return. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's I mean, not the best. Erno is kind of garbage. Um. <laughs> I, I mean, it is, but it's, it is actually like, I think that would be how you'd have to do it. Yeah. I mean, man, we, we were talking about Rust for the first half of the show. Now we're we're uh, talking some shit on C. It's <laughs> it's an interesting episode today. Um, but yeah, like Tony once said, when, when all you have is there, no. I mean, that's that's all you have. But yeah, like I was saying, um, you know, this was it's it's hard to understand all the math in this topic, but these kind of signature bypasses where it's like just something really stupid that breaks such a complex area like cryptography it's just uh i always love seeing that and um i i think i said this towards the start of the show before we even started talking with bastion um uh in the pre-show but 
ECDSA is just so hard to implement correctly, it seems. It's been messed up so many times. Sony messed it up. Here it's been messed up by Stark Bank. Um, there's been other cases where it's been messed up. Like, I know crypto as a whole, in general, is just really hard to deploy properly. Um, I'm not even talking about rolling your own crypto, which would be, like, terrible. But even just using an existing crypto technology like RSA, um, you have to take a lot of things into consideration for it to be effective. ECDSA just feels like it's even more difficult, though, um, than perhaps even RSA is. Um, and, and I, I kind of wanted the, you to bring up something that you brought up before the show, too. Yeah, and I with, feel like um, I know where you're going with that. Uh, um, I tend to feel like, you know, with RSA, you kind of have an intuitive understanding of that idea where, okay, you know, you can't reverse this division. You know, you divide this number, or you can't reverse this multiplication, sorry, very easily. Like, you don't know what two numbers were the input. Uh, it, if you understand RSA, like, it makes a bit of intuitive sense. And I feel like it's a lot harder to have that intuitive understanding of any of the elliptic curve uh, cryptos. Oh, um, like, it's just, you don't really think about it. Like, it's just, it's more complicated. Um... It's not as intuitive and ready, readily understood as some like RSA, so it's easier to just wrongly make assumptions. Um, and I, I think that probably leans to at least some of the errors that pop up is just the lack of real familiarity. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, that's the cause of this bug, right? Like you would have to really dig into and understand the ECDSA specification to check for this case. Um, so yeah, I mean, it is kind of a straightforward bug as far as crypto goes, but I mean, it's one of those logic bugs where you can kind of forgive um, the implementation not being aware of like the little nuances there. So um, unfortunately, in this case, though, it does affect quite a few products uh, and any products that might be using those libraries so um somewhat widespread issue though I, i'm not sure how much ecdsa is being used too much um it, it is kind of one of those it's not a crypto you see super often compared to something like rsa but i mean you know, apparently the library has been downloaded you know over 7 million times in the last 90 days that's reasonably significant yeah, that's a little bit yeah <laughs> yeah it's a good call though but uh yeah. That said, we can move on to our next topic here, which is a Vuln in G Suite. Um, this is from Secretly Hidden, uh, a researcher that's been focusing primarily on Microsoft and Google bounty programs. Uh, and this one is an attack against G Suite, which is Google's business offering that provides storage, email, and apps similar to that of like uh, Microsoft 365. Um, it's worth noting this issue is from 2018, but it was just detailed publicly last week. So we're still, that's why we're still covering it. Um, Anyway, one of the important things that G Suite provides is administration capability of being able to manage accounts and permissions, as that's pretty important in a corporate environment, as you can imagine. Um, and as such, there has to be a super user or a super admin. And this researcher thought, what if I could add myself as a super admin to any G Suite organization? That would be a pretty powerful capability to have, right? Um, this post then details um, Google Domains, which is Google's uh, own registrar and how they let you create a G Suite subscription that you can manage through Google domains. Um, and that includes managing payment methods, adding super admins, things like that. Um, all of this happens through requests to and from uh, Google domains, and it includes the organization ID there. Given the fact that it includes an organization ID, you can probably guess what the issue is at this point. Um, that ID doesn't seem to be protected from being forged for another organization that you don't own. So there's an, there's kind of an IDOR there. Um, obviously, you would need to know the ID of a target organization to take advantage of this, which would have been a limiting factor. Um, but it's still a pretty impactful vulnerability to have, because essentially, if you can control those uh, the ID in those requests, you substitute the organization ID for one that you want to target, and you can just add yourself as a super admin in that organization. Yeah, so um, org ID and the org name had to be changed across the three requests here, but ultimately, it's a you know, dead simple issue. Um, kind of just the IDOR changing the value and away you go, especially for Google. But it's one of those cases where it's just like, 
or it's another one of those cases where it really comes down to the cross um cross application communications that are happening and where you know one place probably does these sorts of checks and the other place here you know it, domains is not primarily used for managing your g suite users and yet here it is being used to manage your g suite users um like it's not the primary feature thus making it a good spot to look for issues um i mean i like it it's a dead simple issue especially for a google app it feels like it's one of those that just comes out because it's not like their primary area of understanding as they wrote this. It's just like, oh, this is just a little value-added feature. It does seem to be a bit of a weak point in Google because I'm almost certain we talked about another issue um, actually in like the Google Apps or the Google Online Apps that was very similar to this. Um, well, not in the sense of like how the attack worked with it being like an IDOR, but that idea of the, you know, checks being in one place, but not being in another place where it's used. Um, I think that I think in the context I'm thinking of, it was an XSS where um, one Google app was protected against it, but another one wasn't. And it kind of interfaced with the first Google app. So, yeah, it's, it does seem to be a bit of a weak point for yeah, Google. It- I think the issue you're thinking of is stealing YouTube thumbnails. Uh, you had on the ads, you were able to, or screenshots from a YouTube video. You could leak the private videos. Um, there was the that ID. one, but I think there was another one in the like, there ha- Google we've Sheets covered or whatever. A few things, possibly, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, seems like something good to look for. But yeah, I mean, like you said, even with that in mind, this. This did like surprise me a little bit with with it being found in, in something like Google G Suite. Um, but yeah, seems like a great kind of bug, a... great little bug. Yeah. Uh, last for vulnerabilities, we have an info leak in Shopify uh, via its Atom feed. Um, this one is a dead simple issue. Um, the news Atom feed normally isn't accessible to the public. It's off off behind password verification. Um, but Shopify also has a preview feature, which can be used to view the news feed without any authentication. <laughs> so just the preview feature just doesn't go through the same control flow and authentication flow. And yeah, you can use that um, to leak information from the Atom feed. Um, you just kind of mentioned the YouTube thumbnails thing. And this kind of shares a similar trait with that where it's like you couldn't view the video directly but you could get thumbnails in the video it's kind of similar here you can just use the preview to to leak information um impact is a bit limited by the fact that you couldn't exploit this against a partner development store they don't really go into detail on why my guess is just that um the previews just have a different workflow for partner development stores or you just can't use them i'm not sure what the case is there it's kind of um something that's specific to Shopify and you'd probably have to know a little bit of the context there, but um, yeah, I mean, just a fairly trivial bypass of using a feature to get around an off flow and it paid out quite good for this researcher. They got $5,000 out of that bounty. So yeah, simple issue, but by no means a, a low bounty. It's just one of those cases of alternative ways of access of accessing the same data. I mean, that's yeah. been a good spot for bugs in general. So our last topic for this week, we have a research paper uh, detailing HTTP header smuggling, which uh, we've talked about HTTP request smuggling a bit in the past. Uh, you know, the idea of the header being parsed differently, like content length primarily between various front ends and proxies and back ends, um, looking for desyncs where one server will parse a header one way, but another part of the chain will parse it a different way. Um, This paper is based on that idea, but focuses more on the mutation of headers and what headers will be accepted and what won't um, when it comes to like the header names and stuff. So like, for example, like replacing a dash with an underscore or adding a space before the colon to separate the value, things like that. Um, Go ahead, Z. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, like, it's looking for that desync similar in a sense to the request smuggling where you have multiple servers that process everything differently. Uh, this one looking for the desync in um, the headers themselves rather than just in how it's going to parse the content length. Although they do act, one of the attacks they did find involved gaining request smuggling by attacking the content length header. Uh, they had 
they detail a number of issues here. Uh, most of them, or like all of them, are in or involve uh, AWS's API gateway. The first one being their gateway. Like, so with the gateway, you can set up like an IP restriction saying like only these IPs are allowed to actually access, uh, you know, the endpoint, the proper endpoint through the API. Uh, so all they had to do there was tamper with the X forwarded for. So when you first hit the API gateway, it's going to take your IP. It's going to append it into the, or it's going to add it into the X forwarded for header and pass that along. That way the receiving server who can't see the direct connection, can't see where it came from, still knows what the IP is. Uh, but what they found was that there was, um, was that the API gateway would take uh, X forwarded for it would only be scanning those headers for which header starts with X forwarded for and then read out the value from it. So when it did that, um, you can kind of imagine the scenario where somebody enters their own X forwarded for header that just adds in a. Sorry, I kind of missed one step here, being that if you actually sent in your own X forwarded for header, it would remove it. It would strip, you know, your own. It would replace it with uh, trusted values, basically. Um, but because of adding, let's see if I can find it in the document here. If I can type. Yeah, so you can see this request coming in here. That's X forwarded for space ABCD. So if one of them only scans for the X forwarded for header and just line that starts with that, um, it'll see this header and the proper one. If it doesn't actually look for anything, it just takes the first one that it sees. It might take the injected value, which is the case they found for getting around AWS IP gateway, API gateway IP restrictions, <laughs> um, was basically by injecting that header injecting whatever IP that would be allowed, and it would go ahead and let them through. A uh, similar issue on Cognito, although less useful in this case on AWS Cognito. Um, so Cognito is for like authentication. Um, it's their authentication provider. Uh, with confirm forgot password and forgot password, it was IP rate limited. So you'd get to make however many attempts and then it'll block your IP. You can use this. Unfortunately, what they found was that you can only use this to kind of reset the uh, rate limit once. So it's not that effective. Uh, but what they did was by including, um, instead of having a, basically this 0x0b, which I believe is the backspace character. I should have looked that up. Uh, but they found that including, you know, that character, Z, or something else in there, it would parse it as some other value, thus getting around the rate limit. Um, when it came to cache poisoning, so they did find with cache poisoning, it's going to depend on having a cache in front of it. Uh, but what they found was um, the AWS API gateway, as it would parse the headers, it was also vulnerable to an issue with the host header. Um, so doing a host header with this ABCD space ABCD, it'll parse it, see this header. Oh, it starts with host, so I'm good. Um, takes that header um, and then looks up, you know, the actual host and you trust that host value instead of what it actually was. Uh, but the caching server that's going to be in front of this will see or should in theory be parsing the actual uh finding the proper host header um and when it finds the proper host header it'll create the cache entry based off of what api give api gateway gives back which is going to be the wrong host creating kind of that uh uh cache poisoning scenario or allowing for that at least finally the last attack that they covered here was not Exactly their own attack. It's the one that kind of prompted this research, which was pulling off this sort of attack. Um, and this was researched by Amit Klein, uh, who did a talk at Black Hat 2020, where he used content length 
um, kind of just attack the content link to create a, a request smuggling situation. Uh, using content length, one parses it correctly, one sees content length as zero, you can smuggle in your extra requests there. Overall, like, I think it's kind of an interesting area, one to consider. I've tried, like, duplicating. I haven't played around much with uh, just messing with the parsing in this way, but, I mean, solid attack for sure. I mean, I could definitely see other places having similar issues. It's just a fun attack that I'm sure we're going to see pop up in other places and in other ways, too. Yeah, I mean, anytime you have these kind of desyncs where it's dependent on how it's being parsed and it's kind of breaking outside of the little box that you have the standards in, um, there's bound to be interesting behavior. And yeah, I mean, this this is another one of those cases where the impact here could be really large depending on where it's being attacked. So yeah, I agree. I think we'll see some variants of this uh in some areas where it's being found, and we'll probably end up covering them, I imagine. Uh, I'd be very surprised if we don't see it again. So, yeah, just a really good really good post. And I didn't manage to read all the way through it. Um, unfortunately, I was wow, kind of short on time. Wow, we're covering it and you didn't read it. Hey, you read most of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I did read, like, um, half of it, but it is a fairly long post because it just covers a lot. Um, but, like, from what I did read, like, it was pretty easy to follow. Um, I understood the root cause of like all of these bugs. I just didn't, I wasn't able to read into how they took advantage of them fully. Um, but yeah, like from what I read, it was, it was a very good post and they have some good diagrams and stuff here to help you understand the flow of what's going on between like users front end and the back end and stuff like that. So yeah. Yeah. Good um, post all around. Yeah. So that's most of our topics for this week. Uh, Z, you had a few shout outs. I'll let you get to those and then we'll move to wrapping up the show. Yeah, I've got a couple shout outs here. One is IDOR through MongoDB objects IDs predictions. Um, it basically just lays out the structure of the Mongo object IDs. If you've dealt with Mongo before, um, it basically, you know, when you query, all the objects you're getting back are going to have a object ID in it, even if you didn't add it manually. Actually, I don't even think you can add it manually. Not completely sure about that. Um, but often these will end up being used to like look up things and they'll be used as these unique IDs. They're maybe not as unique as you would think or expect. Um, and this is just basically calling it out and... You know, if you do run into the case where it looks like you've got a fairly large, unique value, maybe not so much. Uh, so they don't call out any specific issues um, or any specific findings. So I didn't think it would be worth covering it in full. But on a whole, I figured I would at least shout it out because it's a uh, simple enough thing to start looking for yourself. Uh, Tanny Wah mentions this is very similar to the Snowflake ID from Twitter. Yeah, I mean, a lot of places do the UUIDs that have, or I guess they'd be, uh, case suits, uh, case sortable, universally unique IDs, uh, where they'll base it on, like, the timestamp and some other little bits of information. So this sort of attacks have been around. Um, this one's just specifically calling out the Mongo one, so I thought it was worth at least shouting out for anybody looking for it. Um, and the second shout out was a presentation, um, which is, despite what it looks like it is in English, um, it's doing cross-site history leaks. So the idea being that you visit one website and they can determine if you visited, you know, some other website. And it's just an overview of several attacks. Some of them aren't patched. But I don't believe any of them are actually new to this. It's just a summary of them or an overview of them. So I thought it was a good summary. I, Despite just being slides, good read. I'm not sure if there's actually a presentation associated with it. I couldn't find it. It does mention this Excess Leak Summit 2021. However, I couldn't find anything out about that either. So I don't know. Um, but I find it was... Uh, or I found it was kind of interesting anyhow. So 
Why don't you shout that one out, Austin? Those are the two I've got. All right. So uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up the show. Um, thanks to everyone who tuned in. You can catch the VOD on Twitch or on YouTube at 6 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. Uh, we also have previous podcasts up on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more links on Anchor. Uh, if you want to join our Discord and follow us on Twitter, links for those are down below or in the chat. I'll put a link to our Discord as well. Um, again, we have a giveaway of Bastion's Rust book running this week. Uh, we'll be selecting winners uh, end of Monday next week. If you want to get involved, uh, we'll launch the giveaways channel. Uh, on the discord and that's where you can go ahead and react to the message there to enter um also there is a discount code that everyone can use um the coupon command on on twitch will will get you that um let me just get exactly what it was there yeah so pod day 021 um and that'll give you 30 percent off on the manning publishing store um but yeah with all that said we'll be back tomorrow for the binary episode at 7 p.m eastern 4 p.m pacific um, which is where we'll also cover the spot the Vaughn solution that was shown in the pre-stream. Um, we also have that in the Discord as well for anyone who might have missed it. And yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see you tomorrow when we return for the Binary Podcast. Take care.